<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Everybody, welcome back to The Egg Show. This week, we have special guest, Brian Clayton. Brian is CEO and co-founder of GreenPal, an online marketplace that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals. GreenPal has been called the Uber for lawn care by Entrepreneur Magazine and has over 100,000 active users completing thousands of transactions per day. Before starting GreenPal, Brian founded Peachtree Inc., one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, growing it to more than 10 million a year in annual revenue before it was acquired by Lusa Holdings in 2013. Here to talk about a broad range of things from entrepreneurialism to a, a, and small business growth to marketing and bootstrapping businesses from zero revenue to profitability and exit. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Brian Clayton. How are you, Brian? Hey, Ryan. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We are thrilled to death to have you here. Awesome. Really appreciate your time and really appreciate you guys reaching out to come on the show. It was it was a, a welcome um invitation we were excited to have you when when you guys reached out so well cool i I love sharing my experience 20 years building businesses and and so uh love love trying to help people avoid some mistakes i've made along the way well i think what i love about your story and your industry is actually something so i spent a lot of years working for a guy named don aslett and don was uh he was known as the world's number one cleaning expert for about 30 years and uh, he sort of ushered in what became the the martha stewart's and and this kind of thing And, uh, you know, starting in the early 80s, but he had what some people might think of as not the sexiest career, right? He had he had started a janitorial company when he was in college and wanted to work his way through and ultimately built that into a career where he was, you know, writing books and on the lecture circuit and doing all these great things. But it began life as sort of this this thing that I don't think people think is very sexy. And I think that's one of those things that that you have in landscaping and the landscaping business. And so I wonder if you talk a little bit about sort of the the early days of your entrepreneurial journey and sort of how you got your start in landscaping. And then, you know, here in a little bit, we'll talk about all the exciting things you're up to these days with it. Yeah, to your point, uh, the least sexier the business, probably the greater your chances of success, especially, you know, like that's been my experience 20 years in this one industry. I actually uh, rewind 20 some odd years ago, started mowing yards in high school as a way to make cash, uh, to buy a pair of soccer cleats that I wanted to to buy. I was hassling my, my dad to buy me these, these cleats. And he, and he said, you know what, get off your butt, go mow the neighbor's grass. And he forced me to go mow the neighbor's yard. Luckily, uh, that was my first taste of entrepreneurship. And I, it just stuck with me. I loved the ability to make as much money as I wanted and not have to hassle my folks for, for money. And I just kept at it. I, by the end of that first summer, I had four or five customers and kept mowing yards all through high school, all through college, and uh, put myself through college uh, mowing grass. And when I graduated college, I had to make a decision. Was I going to enter the job market and and basically take a pay cut? Or was I going to stick with this lawn mowing business? Didn't really want to be a grass cutter the rest of my life. But I mean, it was it was working. I had a few helpers and and I and I went to business school, so I laid out a little little crude business plan and uh, and just just went at it. And over five years, uh, I actually had a, a nice uh, little landscaping company with about 20 employees um, and and uh, was profitable. And so over a 15 year period of time, built that company up to one of the biggest landscaping companies in the, in, uh, the state of Tennessee, uh, over $10 million a year in revenue, over 150 employees. And so over a 15 year period of time, started with just me and a push mower to me and 150 people. And uh, in 2013, that business was acquired by one of the largest landscaping companies in the United States. And, and so after I sold that business, I kind of retired. I, I took some time off and just got bored and realized something about, about myself that uh, I needed to be in the game, needed to be in, in the arena, I needed to be building something. And so that's where the idea for GreenPal, which is the Uber for lawn mowing, if you will, uh, came to me and, and recruited two co-founders and went to work on this project. Yeah, no, I think I think that's an amazing story. And I love that sort of, you know, being pushed into it. I've got a 14 year old son that's going to get a, a awakening this year. Uh, <laughs> you know, to date, I've got a fun little riding lawnmower. So for me, it's honestly a time to have a beer and, you know, do a little lawn mowing. So I actually don't mind doing it that much. Yeah. But uh, but he will pay, be playing a much more active role. He's a he's at that stage where he's starting to look for his own money and we're tired of financing him. So I think well, it'll be you, uh, a, a great opportunity for him. You got to get him the cheap 
push lawnmower that without the self-propelling wheels just to break them in right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I wonder then, so if you talk about, you know, maybe this is more relevant in your experience growing the business uh, as Peachtree, but um, probably equally, you know, some equal parts. So one thing that your business has, and as you know, this is something, so I run an advertising marketing agency and I always joke that our biggest competitor is someone's cousin because they always have a friend or a cousin or a brother or a somebody that knows how to work Photoshop. And, and you know, why pay us all these big bucks when they can just use their cousin? And uh, you guys have sort of that times 10 in that, just like the example I just gave, uh, you know, you're competing with somebody's 14 year old son. And so, you know, basically now, maybe not when you get into full-blown landscaping, but as, as it pertains to, you know, marketing a landscaping company, I wondered if you'd talk a little bit about how you grow a business when your b- steepest competition might live in the house. Yeah, it certainly is. It's a competitive business. It's, it's hyper-competitive. The barriers to entry are low. Uh, the margins are pretty thin. And uh, looking back, you know, over, over 20 years in business, uh, it's something that has made sense to me is looking at the, my journey in business as a video game almost in like 10 levels of Super Mario World. And as you progress through the, the journey of starting your business from scratch, you almost kind of like go through these different levels. And so in the landscaping business, level one was just trying to hustle up 20 customers and trying to hustle up an extra few hundred bucks a week. And then level two was, well, now I need to buy a better lawnmower. I need to, so I need to make, I need to save 12 grand and I, and I need to become more efficient and I need to figure out a way to pass out flyers, to get a hundred customers and I need to maybe get a part-time helper. And then level three is more like, well, okay, now I'm not to your point. I'm competing with Chuck in a truck. I'm competing with Peter in a pickup. And so now like my margins are, are getting really thin. I'm actually losing money on some of these lawns. And so now I got to figure out how am I going to get route density? How am I going to get to where I don't have to drive 15 or 20 minutes all over town to go uh, mow a yard when I can just do 10 yards in one neighborhood. And then maybe like level five might be like, okay, well now I've got 300 customers and uh, I'm profitable and I've got five helpers, but I'm still physically mowing yards. So now I need to figure out the, how to hire an operations manager. And, and then, uh, and then, and then also I want to get a crack at some of this commercial work. And, and that's where most people get stuck in this business. And so there was a long period of time trying to like get to level six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And these aren't like static defined systems that I like, I'm just using a metaphor, if you will. And so like getting over the hump of myself, mowing yards with a handful of helpers to myself and a sales system and a sales manager and a sales staff and an operations manager and a full-time mechanic and a, and uh, like 10 or 15 crew foremen and figuring out all the little routines and processes it took a long time, a lot of trial and error and a, and a lot of just taking every dime that the business made and reinvesting it back into the business and trying to figure out how to make the routines and processes uh, really work and run predictably. Uh, these, these days, it's easier to figure this stuff out because there's, there's online courses that'll teach you how to do this stuff in most every business. But back then, there wasn't. There wasn't YouTube. There wasn't podcasts like this one. And so uh, it was just a big, long, it was a long trial and error process. But it was one that I just had decided that I was going to have the biggest landscaping company in town. I don't know why, but I really just felt like business was the path that I could just make something of myself. And I think it's always been that for me. It's like, this is the thing that I have access to where I can improve my, my, my accomplishments in life and I can create opportunities for myself and those uh, on my team and around me. And so I just stuck with it and just kept at it. And, and, uh, over a 15 year period of time, built it up to one of the largest landscaping companies in the state. So um, with Peachtree, did you focus only on lawns or did you actually do other stuff like um, retaining walls and, um, you know, other generic landscaping stuff like hardscapes? Yeah, it's a good question. So as time, time went on, you know, started, I'll mow your grass for 25 bucks. And then as, as, as we kind of progress through these kind of, metaphoric levels, I, uh, we, we didn't do that kind of work anymore because it wasn't profitable. We had to kind of like leave that, that, that service sector, but we did, we did so gradually. And then we started kind of rebuilding the company around focusing on those bigger projects that, that, uh, you know, those big retaining wall jobs or, or big full service, like design build uh, projects that were 50 or hundred or $200,000. And then also we really attacked the commercial space. We, we did a ton of restaurants, ton of banks, a uh, ton of uh, 
apartment complexes, office parks, airports, things like that, like the full like commercial maintenance, we gradually eat over about a five, six year period of time. We were able to kind of prove ourselves in that, in that sector. And, uh, and, and really it had to kind of cut our way into it. It was one that, you know, the first couple of contracts we were doing at cost, just trying to figure out how to price the stuff and how to build the systems to, to execute the service. And, and uh, that's where a lot of companies in this industry get hung up. It's just trying to, to navigate that. And so we did, we had to leave this kind of unprofitable uh, service that we started the business on to, to evolve it into one that, that we could grow a bigger business in. And that was really kind of where the impetus for GreenPal came from, because as we grew this company, we still got 40 or 50 phone calls a day uh, for people looking for just basic grass cutting. And we didn't offer it we, because it just wasn't profitable for us. So we would refer out a couple smaller service providers and then they would call back and be like, oh, they didn't call me. You know, they wouldn't return my phone call or they didn't show up. Do you have any more? And it became this big like, like hassle. And, uh, and so when I sold that business, I thought, okay, well, an app needs to exist to make these connections easier because people still need this service done. The problem is the smaller service providers that, 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 that offer those services um, are hard to find. They, they don't have an online presence. They don't really have a brand. And so that's where the idea for GreenPal came from. I was kind of like solving my own problem. Yeah, that's a, a good way to take, you know, like, Phone calls like, oh, I can't handle this, can't handle this, can't handle this. And then realizing that, oh, there needs to be a solution for this. And then by the, you know, the, just because you've sold your business and you had some downtime, you were able to take that idea that you had stored in your head and say, hey, now's the time. Let's do this. Exactly. And the, and the only reason I said, let's do this was because I wanted to get back in the game. And I didn't, I didn't really understand how hard it was going to be. And that was probably a good thing. If I had known how hard it was going to be to start an app like this in a marketplace, I, I never would have done it. Yeah. And so luckily, <laughs> yeah. I was naive. Uh, I didn't know <laughs> what I didn't know. And uh, and and so you know, fast forward now to my second entrepreneurial act. You know, Green Powell is now a uh, uh, eight year overnight success. We have over two hundred thousand homeowners that use the app to get their grass cut. Uh, did twenty million dollars in revenue last year. And so growing this business from literally we've ended our first year with 20 customers, half of them are my friends and family to now several hundred thousand learned a lot. I had to reinvent myself as an entrepreneur, had to learn how to build software, learn how to lead teams to build software. It was a complete, just like reinvention of everything I knew about business. And uh, the only thing that kept me going through that was that I'm always going to be working on my best idea. I'm always going to be like working on the best uh, problem that, that I know to solve. And that's what got me through the first four or five years of, of Green Pal because they were really tough. Yeah, no, I wonder if you talk a little bit about just sort of your, I, I mean, I'm getting a sense just from having this little bit of conversation with you. I mean, like you feel like the type of person who would be entrepreneurial, right? You feel driven. You feel like, you know, you've got a passion about this sort of thing. But I wonder if you talk a little bit about your entrepreneurial influences. So you said that you were sort of nudged into doing this, you know, your dad sort of forced you into it. But did you have any role models or, or influencers as you were uh, maturing that sort of helped you with this stuff? Or was it really sort of a do it all on your own kind of thing from the beginning? You know, in the early days, we didn't have access to the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world. And, and, and so, and so like that stuff is, I think a lot more accessible now than it was 20 years ago. That said, yes, there, there were early influences in, in kind of my philosophies on how I built my first business. One was Dave Ramsey and, you know, love him or hate him. Uh, a lot of his principles uh, are, are, are sound. And so like I would, I was mowing grass every day, 12, 13 hours a day. And I was, I was listening to talk radio on some headphones and every day, like Dave Ramsey was wedged between two shows I wanted to listen to. Um, and, and so I kind of had to listen to him. And, and so every day beating into my head, you know, him talking about, you know, creating as it relates to business, building a, a, a debt-free business, a sustainable business, one that has good solid found, you know, footing and, and not, and not taking on debt. And so these philosophies were just beating in my head every day for years. And luckily that stuck with me. I built that first business debt free. And that was the reason, the reason uh, why I was able to get it sold. Because when, when it came time to explore an exit for that company, we had zero debt, had a real clean balance sheet. And it was just, it was just a real like clean transaction. Whereas a lot of my competitors, 
yeah, they might've had a $5 million business to sell, but they also had like four and a half million dollars in debt. And so they didn't really have a business. And even like the scarier thing is they didn't have a, not only did they not have a business, but they had a chain around their neck because they had to run that business like it or not. They were, they, they had, they had all this debt to service, you know, like we sent out like a hundred trucks every day and our competitors, you know, were sending out tons of vehicles and assets every day too, except for every one of them had like a lease payment or, or, a, or, a, or a debt payment on it. And so if you're not careful, you can get into a point in business where it's, it, it becomes like you're, you're, you're a slave to it and you, you have no outs because you, you have taken on all of these, these sources of financing and you have to run it just to service them. So luckily, like I listened to Dave Ramsey a lot and that helped me build a, a, a solid, like sustainable uh, debt-free business, which is why I was able to get it sold. And then, so then that, you know, parlays into Green Pal. We haven't raised any capital, haven't taken on any debt. And a lot of that, you know, speaks back to that kind of slow and low sustainable approach. So that's somebody that, that's been very influential um, in terms of how I approach business. N- nowadays, you know, there's just so many uh, gurus in, in, in yeah. the tech space that, that I listen to on a daily basis that help me kind of form how, how I think about building our marketplace and how I think about building technology and building products. And so nowadays you can like pop up YouTube and, and just listen to somebody 10 times smarter than you. But back then it wasn't, wasn't yeah. quite that easy. All you had no, was talk radio. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny because I, I think I'm kind of late to the game on Dave Ramsey. Um, I, I just actually read one of his books in the last two weeks. And, awesome. uh, and I've recently started picking up some of his uh, episodes. You can go back and listen to his episodes on YouTube. Um, I'm at a stage in life where I'm starting to look at investing money and things like that. And he's obviously one of the names that comes up quite a bit. So I, I'm sort of fresh to him. But um, my mom has been listening to him for a million years and, and used his techniques to get totally out of debt and all these things. And, uh, and so, yeah, no, I, I, I hear you espousing the virtues of him. I wondered though, um, just, and this is just a matter of perspective as people are probably sort of contemporary in age. Um, I wonder what you think about uh, sort of access, access to influence. So in your case, you were sort of relegated to what you could pick up on the, the AM dial on your little AM FM headset. That's right. And so, and now, like you mentioned, there is a, a heap of these people on YouTube. Basically, anybody that wants a platform can have a platform these days. Yeah. And so, I wonder, in, in your situation, or and and this is purely just opinion, but do you think you're you're better off now or better off then? In that back in the in the the early days when you're founding Petri, and you were you know I guess largely problem solving on your own. You know, maybe you were getting some sound financial advice or whatever from from Dave Ramsey, or you know maybe other programs you were listening to. But it seems like we were forced into making more decisions on our own and sort of figuring out things trial and error. And I find now, even in my own practice, and even as I'm trying to grow my business, I find myself listening to all these influencers and all these guys, you know, that have networks everywhere and who are offering up uh, their perspective on YouTube. But I'm finding that it almost puts me into this state of paralysis where all of a sudden I'm, I'm overwhelmed with, uh, with positive influence to the point that nothing happens because everybody's conflicting. And so I just wondered as a matter of opinion, what you think about sort of, you know, I don't want to reminisce about the old times and show, show our age, but, but if you think it's actually better for entrepreneurs or, or worse or in, in what ways? You know, in, in, in short, the short answer to that question, from my perspective, my opinion, it's so much better now. Like there is just so much more access to knowledge. Um, and there's, it's so much easier to understand and learn the things that you need to learn and whether it be around like tax mitigation or HR or, or how to implement technology into your business. The problem is, but on the other hand, the problem is there's just so much of it. And how do you know what, to focus on and how do you know what to like internalize and, and bring into your organization? How do you know what, what is BS? And so, yeah, on the one hand, like there's so much and it's hard, but on the other hand, it's, you don't even need to go to college. You just, you can just pop up, you can just listen on YouTube or, 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 or podcasts and, and learn how to do this stuff. I think like there's, there's two, there's two ways you can look at it. Um, going back to the video game analogy, you almost need to like select the, the information source that applies to what stage of the game you're in. And so it applies to what level of the video game you're in. And so like, if you are on level one and all you need to worry about is getting to the end of level one and raising the flag and just, you don't need to worry about Bowser. You need to worry about level one. And so that you might be like tuning into side hustle podcasts 
podcast uh, people like, hey, here's how you can start your side hustle. Here's how you can get in the lawn mowing business nights and weekends and make an extra four grand a month. And then like from there, you know, you can graduate towards different uh, sources of information all the way up till like maybe you're, once you get to level six and you're doing a million dollars in revenue, well, then you need to be seeking out gurus that talk about this is how you build systems, routines and processes in your business to get to 10 figures in revenue. And so you don't need to worry about all that other stuff. You need to worry about somebody who's talking about how you get from 1 million revenue to 10 and here's how you do it or how you create a sales system. Like you need to really understand, okay, this is how I create a predictive predictable sales system uh, to where we identify leads, we uh, set up a meetings, we pitch and we close, we follow up and we retain. And like there, there's a there's sales methodology that there's people that will teach you how to do that. Whereas when I was in like 2004 trying to figure this stuff out, I mean, maybe I, you know, there's some couple books I could get, but I couldn't, I couldn't pop up an online class and learn how to do this stuff. So it's so much better now than it's ever been. But it's just, you have to, you have to really, you can't just tune into, I mean, I love Gary Vaynerchuk, but Gary Vaynerchuk ain't, isn't going to tell you how to build a sales system for your landscaping company. Like, you, you, like you, that's entertainment. That's Tony Robbins. You need to really drill into who is talking about these specific things for your industry and how to tactically do them. And a lot of times that takes a lot of work. And, and the reality is people would rather watch, um, you know, 12 hours of the queen's gambit than than 12 hours of youtube on their tv and uh or, or maybe even just half um and so the the reality is people will get like uh overwhelmed with just there's so much and a lot of it is like okay you're gonna spend a lot of time just kind of sifting through a lot of the crap but once you key in on that on that person who is teaching you how to do these things where you're at at your stage of the game in your industry it can just oh my gosh save you years not only save you years but help you become successful whereas you may not have otherwise ever done so. Yeah, I think there's two things that I, I just kind of want to pile on to your video game metaphor. Um, I think that, you know, I really like the way we're, we're laying this out, this idea that all you're trying to do is achieve sort of, you know, for, for young people, we're using the Mario uh, metaphor here. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, you might have to go back in time or if you've got a Nintendo Switch, you can pull it up. But, uh, <laughs> but this was a game that we used to play when we were young. And uh, so anyway, but this idea of just achieving, you know, whatever it is, level one. And in, in the case of Mario, it was 1.1 or 1-2, or 1-3, yeah. before you got to 1-4, where you had to face Bowser, your first you know, big challenge, or in the, right. in the frame of business, it's your competitor. And so, but I, I like the way you're laying out this stuff, but one, one just sort of thing I wanted to pile on too that I think is a takeaway, is this idea that you know it, it's repetition, it's actually getting in and doing the work too. Because Absolutely. not only is it learning the thing that you need to do, but it's actually getting in and doing it. And, and you know, to become a proficient player at Mario, you played those levels hundreds of times. And, and it's not like you could save your game back then. So, like, right. you got as far as you got. You yep. know what I mean? And, and, and you so, picked up and, a copy of Nintendo Power and you learned about what stage of the game you were at. Exactly. And, 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 and I mean... That's just, you have to do that. You can't skip that stuff. Yeah. Well, and you weren't proficient at a hundred games. You were proficient yeah. at two games, you know, right. or three games or one game. Right. And, uh, and I think that that's really important. The other aspect you touched on that I just wanted to sort of call out was this willingness to learn or this, uh, you know, I think a lot of us, especially if you've been doing something for a while, kind of feel like, oh, well, I kind of know it all, you know. And I think this idea of being receptive to hearing what other people have to say, in your case, early on, it was Dave Ramsey. Nowadays, maybe it's, you know, whomever, whomever YouTuber, X, Y, or Z. And, uh, and those guys are giving you the advice that you need to sort of, you know, address your next step. But, um, yeah, but I think that exa willingness exactly. to Exactly. To, to your point, like one, a guy that I listen to a lot is, is a guy that you never heard of. His name is Casey Winters. And Casey Winters was, was the first what they call growth lead at Grubhub uh, back in 2008. And he figured out how to like this was before food delivery existed and he figured out how to market Grubhub in the early days. And he's like a tactician on, on SEO and paid marketing, all these things. And I, and I listen to everything this guy puts out, but the point is, it's not going to be the big, broad marquee names that everybody knows. It's not going to be Tony Robbins. It's not going to be Gary Vaynerchuk. It's not going to be uh, what's the 10 X guy that's really riding around in the Royals Rolls Royce. Um, oh gosh. Uh, you, I've, I've seen his ads, but I skipped yeah, through those. <laughs> yeah, it's not that uh, uh, Grant Cardone. It's not going to be Grant Cardone. It's not going to be uh, 
Ed, my left. Like these guys are smart and they're successful, but like it's what they're talking about is so broad that it doesn't apply to where you're at. Like you have to find the tacticianer, like the practitioner of what it is you're doing and dial in and really learn as much as you can from them. And also not be afraid to pay for what it is that they're teaching. Like a lot of times, I mean, people will not pay 500 bucks or a thousand bucks to, uh, to learn something that could save them five years and make them a million or 5 million or $10 million. And it's, it's not, I'm not saying go out and buy every course you can get by because Lord knows there's a lot of crap out there. But what I'm saying is once you have found something that you're getting value from, dude, golly, just invest the money uh, because it's going to save, you're going to skip three levels, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, well, and you, touched, you touched on it earlier, too, that, you know, it, you mentioned having a, a business school background, but I mean, you, you really can do sort of, a, you know, different type of education nowadays. You can do this uh, hyper focus. It's almost like an online vocational school where you can literally go and just learn the things you need to learn to do the things you want to do. That's instead right. of this broad level learning that you get in a university setting, for example. Well, and I, I would exactly. say maybe maybe. Uh, I would say that the, uh, you know, hiring the pro, you paying the $500 or $1,000 is almost like the cheat code to jump to the next level, skip the three, like you said, right to exactly. level three, you get where you need to be. And then also in high school, you're not really, you know, you're mowing lawns, you're, you're getting by, you're doing what you need to do. Now you own an app and you need to know about SEO. You need to know about all this stuff. And so, you know, you wouldn't have been listening to this guy that teaches about SEO in high school because it's not relevant to what you're doing. You're not owning a, a exactly. software company. So I, I like how you frame that in, in niching down and going after where what matters at your stage of the business. Um, talking about That's stages right. of the business, um, most people don't go through an acquisition. Most people don't, you know, they work their whole life and they run their business until they retire and they're done. You worked you know, half of your career and then you sold and got out. Can you talk about that process and, and how it happened and, and uh, were you looking to sell or did they approach you? It's, it's a great question. Um, and then you're lucky, you know, if you can get through that, you know, you're one of the few, I, I was lucky in a lot of ways. I had made the decision personally that it was time for me to move on to the next thing because I had taken that business as far as I could. So for me, like my business is always kind of the thrust that causes me to get to the next level of life, to level up in life, to be more than I was last year. And so business is the vehicle for that. And so if I feel like I'm getting complacent and I'm not uh, on the outer edge of my capabilities and I'm not being forced to learn and master new things, I get, I get bored and and it's kind of where I got with that company. I'd already grown it to as big as I could in my market. And I sure I could have probably like taken it regionally or taken it to another city, but I didn't really have the appetite for it. So I, I made the decision like, okay, I've done this for 15 years. It's time to figure out something else. And, 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 uh, and so by the time I made the decision and, and the time I, you know, wire transfer in the bank was a little over two years. And those two years were really, really tough because it's kind of like you made the decision you're going to like leave your wife, but you're still living with her. And as it was really hard because it was just like emotionally, it was no longer going to be mine. And so you kind of come to grips with that. And then, and then you go through the process of buyers coming into your business and, you know, evaluating it. And, and then you, and then you do due diligence with one of them and that's excruciating. So it was, it was a really challenging time. I'm glad I went through it because I learned a lot and, uh, it made me stronger, made me wiser, more humble. Um, so it was a good learning experience for me, but uh, it was it was also hard to accomplish, hard to execute, and also emotionally difficult because I'd had the business for 15 years. It was my identity for who I was, you know. Now that after I sold it, I was like, oh wow, this is not my baby anymore. I actually I actually cried, and so it was emotionally hard, you know, mentally hard, um, and and it was not one that I was prepared for because I didn't really. I didn't really build the business for it to be sold. If I could have done it differently, rewound, you know, like if, if Doc Gordon or, uh, uh, jumps Brown. In the, yeah, Doc, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Doc Brown jump, comes up in the DeLorean and we jump in and, and, uh, and go back to 2005, you know, I could have laid out an exit plan and like executed against that over a five year period of time. And it made my life a lot easier, but I didn't really do that. And so I was trying to reverse engineer a lot of things to make it, 
make it sellable. And so I guess the the takeaway here is, is if you have dreams of selling your business, one, you got to be, you got to build a business that somebody might want to buy. So it's got to be profitable. It's got to be, it's got to have, it's got to have uh, predictability. It's got to have durability. Uh, but also you need to like go through a, a process of, of curating it to be able to be sold and, and to be acquired. And there's a great book about that called uh, Built to Sell that if I had had that book in 2005 would have saved me five years of, 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 or, or two years of hell and, and say, and probably doubled my outcome. Yeah. yeah. Built to Sell is an incredible book. Actually, it's a, one of the, the first ones when I decided to begin reading again, that was one of the first ones I picked up and, awesome. uh, and I feel exactly the same. Actually, uh, that book was very surreal for me because working in advertising and marketing, it was as if he was in my back pocket, like, yeah. <laughs> except for he was doing everything the right way. And so he'd because, gone through all the things that you're going through and yeah. all of the things you screwed up. And he, he was like, if you had had that roadmap, yeah, at least incredible. me speaking, I could have avoided a lot of pain. Yeah. So let, one th- oh, go uh, ahead, Mike. Oh, I was going to uh, ask about the startup process of building your, your app, um, you know, coming from doing lawns and, and all that. It's not like you have a tech background um, going into it. And I'm sure there were a lot of hurdles you had to overcome and a lot of learning curves you had to figure out in the process of starting the app and actually getting it launched. And then when you get it launched, how does it work acquiring customers? And, and then, um, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of, you know, uh, growing pains that came into the first few years of having the app up. Oh yeah, man. I mean, it was hell. Uh, so couple different things like touching upon what we we're talking about earlier. There's just so much information out there. How do you even know what to, what to use? Like the built to sell guy, if you want to sell your business, he's got a podcast and like, I mean, he's right there. I mean, how awesome is that? That didn't exist 15 years ago. So, and the same is to be said, like when I started this software company, you know, the, where I screwed up was, uh, we didn't know how to write software, didn't know how to build software, my two co-founders and I, and we believed that we could just pay a development shop to build it. And then we would market it and we would just be off and going. And so we, we pulled our money together and, and got pulled together $150,000. And we, we built the first version of green pal. We paid a development agency to build it and we launched it. And this is a total flop, just a big failure. It just didn't have the feature set it needed. It didn't work. It, it's just like you, you get, you, it didn't fulfill the, the, the dream of pushing a button and get the grass cut. And so we uh, were really, really humbled by that. And we were confronted with the reality of, okay, wow, if we're going to be in the tech business, in the tech business, we're really going to have to learn how to execute tech, like design, build, distribute software. And so we had to go through a, a period of time where we taught ourselves, like my two co-founders and I, how to write code, how to design software, how to do things like SEO and performance marketing and, and, and usability tests and product design and all of like the probably 20 things you need to be pretty good at to even try to pull one of these things off. We had to kind of learn ourselves. That took a long time. It took three years of just do, learning and then doing and learning and doing and, and just re- repeating that process. But the point is like all that stuff was accessible. It was all like there's online schools learning how to code. There's online schools. There's there's somebody's course on Udemy that you could buy for 200 bucks that will teach you product design that I still use to this day. I still use the fundamentals that I learned in that $200 class on Udemy to this day on how we how we uh, build the software. And so we were able to learn all this stuff. All of the information was accessible. So that's like rewind at the beginning of, of our talk. You know, why, like I said, in, in short, yes, no, it's a lot better today than it was 20 years ago, because back then you couldn't, you couldn't even dream to learn this stuff. Like you would have had to have like known somebody that works somewhere who would take you on as their apprentice. Now you can just learn it all, you know, with an internet connection. It's if so long as you're sufficiently motivated to do so. And so we were and still are. And, and so we just, we worked, worked our butts off trying to learn how to, how to build software and learn how to, and and then do the stuff to build the platform and then fail and then do it all over again. And that's not, you know, there's another thing like with this work-life balance, uh, you know, concept where people starting businesses think you can like work 30 or 40 hours a week and start a business from scratch. I don't see how, 
Um, cause you know, in the early days we were working six, seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day, because there was just so much crap we had to learn that there was only so many hours in the day. And that's why we had to like put in all the hours. Yeah. yeah I think that makes a lot of sense. That's one of those things that people don't really realize going into is, um, once you learn it, you have to learn how to apply it. And then once you apply it, you have to get it, you know, actually functioning correctly and then find the customers. And there's so much involved in starting something like this, that it, it just goes over a lot of people's heads. They don't even think of when, when they're in the early planning phases of that. What were some and, of the, and it, it, Hey, listen, it was me too. Like I, I didn't, I was so naive when I started this business because I didn't know that about all of that stuff. I didn't know that I was going to be confronted with all of the, all of that. And uh, there's a big difference between like inventing a product that does not yet exist and trying to figure out how to build that and how to, how to like architect it in such a way that people will use it and want to use it and get value from it. There's a big difference between that and like building a landscaping business. Like the landscaping business is, is hard enough as it is, but at least you're not inventing the landscaping business. Um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's mapped out pretty well what you need to do. You just need to like do it. This is a lot different. And I didn't understand the realities of it until I got in it was that, wow, we're building a product that does not exist yet. People don't push a button and somebody doesn't come up and just mow their yard magically yet. Uh, but that's what we're doing. And it just, that's a lot harder. Uh, it's a lot harder to do that, but it's a lot more, I think it can be more rewarding too, because it's just a lot more challenging. And when stuff works, it does, it's a lot of fun. So you, you mentioned that when you hired the company to build the software for you initially, there were a lot of hiccups and bugs that were in the original product. Um, from that first iteration of the site to what it is now, um, what are some of the things that you changed and why did you change them? And, um, how did you figure out the process to this needs to be changed? That needs to be changed. Was it just user feedback or was it uh, more of, you know, trial and error? It, it uh, so the vision is, is remarkably like unchanged. The, the, the problem solution in 2013 when we started was it's, it, if your grass is four feet tall, it's just way harder than it should be to get somebody to come out and mow it and pay them and schedule them. It's just harder than it should be because these guys are on the, they're on lawnmowers all day. They don't answer the phone. They, they don't return phone calls. Um, and they might promise to show up and they don't. And then you got to haggle with them over price and then you got to like pay them. It's just a big hassle and it should be a lot easier. Like that was the problem in 2013. And that's the same problem that we're solving today in 2021. And so that remarkably, the vision hasn't changed at all. Now, a lot of the tactics for how we have gotten there and, you know, what they call iterating have just been all over the place. It's trying to figure out what is the product that has to exist on both sides of this transaction to make it to where people come together seamlessly and smoothly and in a fashion to where they both get value have, has been difficult. And it's just been one through trial and error. And the only thing that's kind of kept us uh, forging our way through that is just making it insanely easy for people to talk to us. And so, you know, back then, uh, our product was a piece of crap with a little chat bubble in the bottom. So when it didn't work, you could at least tell us. And so it would hit me up or my co-founder up seven days a week, 24 seven, somebody pissed off because something didn't do what it was supposed to do. And so like that, and that's still how it is today. You know, it, but, uh, we have several hundred thousand people using it today we have less support tickets than we did when we had a hundred, <laughs> but, but at least we make it to where it's just really, 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 really easy for people to talk to us, whether email, chat, phone, whatever, you can hit us up and tell us uh, what you wish it would do, what it didn't do, what you were expecting it to do, what, what features it doesn't have that it needs to have. And so then you're never at a loss for, what are like the two top three priorities you need to be working on your engineers need to be working on that week because you're always accumulating this feedback from people that are using it. It seems like a simple fundamental concept that most everybody just innate, innately would know to do, but it's just, it's, it's almost like the exact opposite. It's almost like people, and I know I've been guilty of this. It's almost like people like put up barriers to customer feedback because they just don't want to hear it because it's painful and it's not fun. And, and, and the, the American consumer is an insanely egotistical, insatiable <laughs> consumer. And so, and so like you're constantly dealing with that and that sucks, but that feedback is happening for you to, so you understand how to build your business out. So there's, and I think that makes sense. 
there's two different types of people you have to deal with with this product that you have uh a the customer the person who wants the lawn cut and b the professional who's doing the the lawn care i think we've kind of touched on the um the customer side of things the professional side of things how does that work for someone who wants to come in and be a provider on your site yeah that's really why we do what we do um honestly i i mean we offer a nice convenience to homeowners if your grass is four feet tall, you, you can in, in, in a minute get somebody hooked up to go mow it. But honestly, like it's not really changing lives. Um, it's a nice convenience, but it's not really like it's not why I get out of bed in the morning. The reason why we do what we do is for service providers to be able to materially improve their lives on the technology we have built. And so the, what we have is a platform that anybody who has a lawnmower and wants to work hard can plug into and and make a hundred grand a year, and that's and that's a lot of fun providing people with the tool set and the opportunity for them to be able to double their business, uh, or 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 quite frankly get their business going from scratch, uh, and all they need to do is is focus on just showing up on time, doing a good job for their clients and everything else from opportunities to, to win more business, to scheduling, to route optimization, to getting paid within 24 hours. All of these things happen automatically because like make, making a living in the lawnmower business is really hard. It's, it's, it's like you get up every day, like before the crack of dawn, you're sharpening lawnmower blades and like, and you're, you've worked for two hours before you even made a dime. And and then you get home and you work your ass off all day and you have grass all over you and like you have calluses on your hands, your back hurts, um, you're sweaty. And then you get back like at, at night and then you have to do bookkeeping and you're pissed off because people haven't paid you. And so like making that person's life better is our mission. That's why we exist. It's why I get out of bed in the morning. And, and that's always been like how we have made our decisions. It's like, okay, does it make vendors more money? Cause if it does, then let's do that. And uh, we have a Facebook group where thousands of these of these service providers kind of share stories and we see it, you know, all the time like, hey, Green Pal, help me buy a new truck or help me get my house out of foreclosure or help me hire a new employee or help me hire my brother or whatever. And that's just a lot of fun. That's why we exist. So yeah, um, go, go ahead, Ryan. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say, I wanted to talk to you about something um, I've sort of begun noticing a pattern in people that are sort of our contemporaries in age. And, um, and that, that is sort of this knowing when to pivot moment. So, I mean, I think maybe it's more so in our uh, generations where we would go and we'd do this job for a certain number of years. And then at some point in our late thirties, forties, we start looking at a pivot. You're kind of a, a unique example because, you know, the, the business you're running ostensibly was made better by your experience in your prior career, but you're for sure doing something totally different. And I wonder if you could just sort of speak to the, I guess the steps you took to know that it was time to change. You mentioned getting, uh, you know, getting bored with what you were doing and some things like that. But I wonder if you just sort of talk about that transition and then sort of where you got the motivation or the strength to go ahead and make the, the pivot. It's a great question. I think, I think the, the, the notion of pivoting, like, I think it can get a lot of people in trouble because they give up too quick. And so then they, they, like, they, they basically miss, uh, they rename giving up for pivoting. And so I, I, I do coaching for business, for, for entrepreneurs and business owners in Nashville for free as a hobby. And so I've got this one guy who I've been working with him for like eight years. And every time, every like six months, he's coming to me with a new idea. And it's, it's like, <laughs> what happened to the last idea? I, I liked that one. He's like, well, I did X, Y, and Z, and I validated that it wasn't going to work. So now I'm pivoting. And it's like, yeah, man, I think your biggest Im impediment to success is you're just not given one of these things like three or five years because that's what it's going to take. So I think the, the idea of pivoting has gotten to, to where it's almost like an excuse to give up and, and do something else. Cause like anybody can launch stuff. Like I'm really good at launching shit, but it's like the, all the other stuff of like getting customers and go like, we've talked about, that's the hard part. Nobody wants to do that. So they just go back to launching. So like, that's my experience on pivoting for me personally. I think like, like a pivot should happen like once or twice in your life. Um, and so that's, that was a life changing moment for me. The day I made the decision to sell the thing that I had worked on for 15 years 
had, had breathed life into from scratch and it was my baby. It was like a life changing moment. And, and it was just one that I, I arrived to, um, almost with a clear conscience because I had, I knew I had taken it so far as I could. And, and I knew that I wanted a new set of experiences. And so it wasn't one that I toiled over a long time. Uh, the only, the only like, uh, downside was that it took so long to see the decision, uh, co you know, be fulfilled. Like it took two years. And so, and so that, that's, that was like the trade-off, right? Looking back, I have no regrets. I, 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 I'm so glad. And, and, you know, the first five years took a huge pay cut because I was making really good money running that business. And I didn't make any money running green pal for five years. Didn't pay myself a, a dime for five years. And so it was almost like I knew that this is what I was going to do with my life. I wanted a new set of experiences. I wanted to be in the tech, uh, tech space. Uh, I admired, I admired a lot of tech entrepreneurs and I wanted to be like them. And so that was just a life changing moment for me. And so, yes, it was a pivot. And I think, like pivots exist, they need to be considered and they need, and you need to know when it's time to pivot, but you need to know that like, you're only, you only get two or three of those in a lifetime. I like yeah, no, that. I love that. I think that's a, that's a different uh, take on it that I've heard from a lot of people. And I really like that. I appreciate sort of the, uh, the no nonsense bit there, because I think you're right. And I, I've actually been guilty of this too, that, you know, every couple of years I have a new startup idea or a new whatever idea, you know, but the one thing that's been consistent my entire career has been my one business. And it's like, so you keep trying to pivot, but the one thing that works is the thing that you're not giving full attention. That, to. Yeah. That so, you've been I on the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah, I know. But then yeah. again, you look at like the great pivots in history, you know, uh, bourbon in, in pivoting into Instagram, like that's the change that changed the course of human history. Right. Um, and I, I recently just listened to a podcast where they, they, uh, they went over the email exchanges between Kevin Sustrom, who was the, the founder of, of Instagram and Mark Zuckerberg and them talking about the acquisition. And man, it was really interesting. And you just look at like the thought processes that this guy was going through as, as he was trying to consider, you know, what they were doing, what they were involved in. And, and so like, that was a big, big pivot, them pivoting this app that was like basically filters into Instagram. And so like, I don't want to, and then and, and Slack, for example, was a pivot uh, out of a video game. Like these guys were making a video game and like it wasn't working, but they had this little chat tool inside the video game. And they was like, well, let's just launch that as a business chat tool. A $40 billion acquisition. And so great pivots happen. But that entrepreneur, in, and I, I would be willing to tell you, say in every case, didn't pivot seven times in three years. Maybe, I mean, maybe there are outliers, but not, not usually. Well, there seems to be a sweet spot too that you're talking about, and and actually we've heard this, you know, also as sort of a pattern among CEOs, is this sort of seven to ten year stretch that it takes to pretty much get anything going, and so I would say, you know, just sort of as a as a point for a lot of people, you know, I mean, if you haven't put in that kind of time, you know, or if you're four and a half years in, or you're seven years in, and you haven't really found success yet, like you just might not be there yet. Like, I mean, it really could still be right up around the corner, you know? I mean, now maybe if you're 25 years in, maybe this isn't the thing for you or whatever, but uh, but it does seem that there's kind of a, a sweet spot around that, you know, for some, maybe aggressively four or five years, but almost always in that seven to 10 re uh, year range before stuff seems to gather enough traction that it becomes, like you said, that eight year overnight success. It really does. I mean, that's how it always is. But on the other hand, you don't want to be... Um, like you don't, you don't want to, you don't want to be just doing something for seven years because you just think that's what you have to do, and and it just it's just not working, and you've wasted seven years of your life. It's kind of like the book, uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He talks about the difference between a manager and a leader. And let's say we're chopping down a forest and the, the manager is the person that is, is like getting the right tools and sharpening the axes and is firing the lazy, uh, at, you know, uh, tree choppers and is bringing in people to officially chop down trees. That's what the manager does. And we're chopping the hell out of some trees down. But the leader is the person that's like got, has a big long ladder and is getting above the tree line and is, and is hollering out wrong forest. <laughs> and so and so it's like you got to like balance those two like yeah you got to put in seven years as a smart manager and like executing and getting stuff done but you also have to think like a leader and understand am i even chopping in the right forest 
And so you kind of have to balance those two. And, and so for us, how it's always, how always it worked for us, we knew we needed to double every year and that was it. And, you know, for the end of the first year, we had like, like a thousand dollars in sales. So it wasn't hard to double the two, but we knew we needed to double every year uh, to stay on course. And as long as we were willing to do that, then, then we knew we were heading in the right direction. But like, if we stalled out like year three, four or five and didn't grow, we'd have done something different. We would have pivoted. We would have pivoted into maybe like a strict SaaS play, like where we just built only software for lawn care services, or we would have pivoted into home cleaning, or we would have done something different if we had stalled out. But the point is we didn't, we, we kept grinding our butts off and we kept doubling. And so that's what kept us going. So does your platform actually provide, um, strategic, um, you know, like route planning and, um, you know, tools for the, the service provider to scale his business? Or is it more, hey, here's an email, you have a lawn, do you want it? Yes or no? How, how does it work for the service provider? It's, it's somewhere in the middle. So let's say you've got a lawn care service that you've got 20 employees and you're doing a million dollars a year in revenue. Green Pal is not the solution for you. Uh, there's great SaaS products where you can pay $500 a month and they'll help you with all of the things that you need to run a million dollar business. And you need, and honestly, you need to be using those. If you, now let's say you're a fireman and you mow three yards a week and you want to mow 20, boy, do I have a product for you. <laughs> Green Pal is the thing that can change your life because now you get like 10 bit opportunities a day. You don't have to go out and drive to these properties. We give you all the data you need to quote right there on the spot from your smartphone. Uh, you, you get your route planned for you every day. You get paid within 24 hours of all the work you do. And you can literally like put another grand in your pocket a week or 10 grand a month. It's however much you want to do running a lawn care business on our technology. So that's where we play. And, and we believe that, that the lawn care business is the best side hustle, small business in the world. And, and, and those are actually the best service providers for homeowners. Like if you're a homeowner, you want to hire somebody who, is going to come out and cut your grass. You don't want to hire somebody who's trying to wrangle 10 people and has hired somebody who just got out of jail to go mow your yard and who won't be there next week. You want to be working with the proprietor and that's the relationship we, we power. Okay. Um, I like that. I think it's a, a good niche demographic to go after. Um, do you, so I, I noticed on your website, I was looking through your markets that you pro provide service for. Um, Say, for example, you know, Salt Lake's a big market, but, you know, Pocatello, Idaho, which is two hours away, might not be. Do you get a lot of leads for markets like that uh, that you wouldn't necessarily have a provider for? Or how there's there's got to be a lot of like in between little markets that you can't really handle. Um, yeah, one of the things we figured out early on was that your huge cities are like LA, Miami, Chicago are really tough for us to crack. And then your really small cities, like a, something that has like a 20,000 population or less is also really hard to crack. And so your cities that are like Oklahoma city, St. Louis, Nashville, uh, you name it, Tampa, Florida. Uh, those are really good cities that, that, that were good for us to attack first because we could get liquidity in them, the critical mass between buyers and sellers quicker. Because what you really live and die by in one of these marketplaces is developing the overlap between supply and demand. And so if you can get the flywheel turning, uh, then then it takes off and it kind of and it kind of grows on its own. But you can't it's really hard to get the, the flywheel turning in a uh, Los Angeles because it's just so big. And it's like it's a big if you can imagine like a big steel like wheel that you're trying to push around. It's just so hard to get the momentum. And so in the early days, we focused on those mid-level markets. And then after that, we went up all the way to your bigger cities and we spent money on getting those going. And then we got all of those done. And then now we're going, now is where we're at year eight, going into all of your smaller towns and, you know, anything like a, uh, I don't know, like a, like a Billings, Montana or something like that. Like, you know, a hundred thousand or less is, is, and there's, there's thousands of those. And so that's where we're distributing the platform into now. The point is, is that when you're doing a locally based marketplace like this, you have to build every single one of these cities from the ground up. Yeah, that's got to be yeah. really tough to find quality providers and then find the clients to feed the providers and keep them wanting to use your service. So it's got to be a, a never ending cat and mouse, you know, kind of 
<laughs> little chase going on there. That, that definitely is. And we've gotten better at it over time, but we're still always improving it. And it's, it is one that you have to build from the ground up. You have to get the good service providers on first, and then you have to market to the homeowners and you have to make those matches. And, you know, in the early days, we spent four years just in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, only in one city, just trying to figure out how to do all this stuff. And then we slowly moved into more towns. I like that. Yeah. Um, I wonder here in these last few minutes, if we can sort of, you mentioned that you do some coaching there in Nashville. So I wonder if we could put your coach's hat on for a minute. And I wanted to talk to you about starting. So we have talked a lot about education and, you know, learning from all these different folks online and all this kind of stuff. But I know that for a lot of people, they get caught up in the in the learning and they don't do enough of the beginning. And I think, you know, in my mind anyway, that's sort of a, a fear thing or a lack of confidence thing. And I, so I wonder if you would talk about if you, you know, were working with a coaching uh, student or client, I, I don't know what you call them, but if you had somebody coming to you for, for advice or coaching, you know, how might you advise them to get started on something? You know, what's this balance between learning and doing? Yeah, it's, it's hard to like, it's easy to get su seduced into fake work. So fake work is, you know, reading a bunch of blog posts, watching a bunch of videos and learning about a bunch of stuff. And also in a tech startup, fake work is just like building, writing code. Mm -hmm. and, and you think you're doing something, you're just, but you're just, all you're doing is writing code. You're not actually developing transactions. And so uh, there's an example right now, a guy that I'm coaching is a longtime friend of mine. He's building a marketplace um, that connects people. Let's say you're, let's say I'm moving to Seattle and I don't know what town is, what neighborhood is cool in Seattle. And so this marketplace will connect me with somebody who is in the part of town I'm considering. And I can jump on a zoom, zoom call with them. Uh, and for 50 bucks, they can school me on if I want to move there or not. And so, and so he is, like I'm telling him, focus just on one city and make one of these advisors a hundred dollars next month. And that's all that matters. And he checked in with me last week and I'm like, he's like, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm building out these tools so these providers can curate their profile. And, and, I'm, and so like, you know, they can have these, like, I like, dude, none of that matters. Like you, you just hand crank that, get it popped up. You do You don't need the self-service tools for them to do it. You just need to do it. And then you need to like try to drive them traffic to get them a hundred or five hundred dollars next month. If you can't do that, the tools don't matter. And so it's like distilling it down to real, uh, what I call RGS, uh, or, or I'm sorry, RCS, real company shit. Like like <laughs> distilling it down to like RCS and making transactions happen and actually getting some money in the door. I, I would rather you make a thousand dollars in revenue. Then, then, then go code on something for nine months and you don't even know if people want to use it or not. Um, and so like just really trying to focus on stuff that's real. And, uh, and so, so, so how do you, how do you like get over the hump and how do you, how do you get out of the mindset of, of, of just, you know, like not doing that stuff. Cause it's not fun. I mean, I got it. I, I think it just matters. Like, where do you, where do you see yourself a year from today? You know, do you see yourself still like with no transactions, no revenue and, 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 and listening to podcasts or do you see yourself with 12 customers? And like, let's just look at like the first year is level one. And like, we have an MVP, we have a dozen customers and we're making $500 a month. Nothing matters until you do that. And all this other stuff, it doesn't matter. And uh, that's what I would tell us. I, and I mean, that's why I, I repeat that advice a lot with, with early stage entrepreneurs. And if they can get over that, then they can usually get to the next level. I like that. Yeah, I think that's great advice, uh, you know, especially with our sort of layering on metaphor earlier with the video games and, and all this stuff. I think that there's this, you know, if you look at or spend any amount of time on like the Instagrams or whatever, and you see all these people who appear to be overnight success, I think there's this inclination and especially young entrepreneurs, this idea that, you know, I, I opened my doors, I hung out my shingle, therefore I should be at this level. So there's this idea that you need yeah. to deliver the, you know, rather than, than delivering sort of a minimum viable product, you need to have this fully fleshed out, you know, Uber before you get to work, you know? And, and yeah. I think that, uh, that you make a great point there that, you know, you may spend all this time building this thing just to find out nobody uses that thing anyway. Right, <laughs> like, and the reality, the reality is, the reality is it's a lot easier to spend six months coding on something than calling a hundred people on Craigslist. Yeah. And uh, most people, like, most people would rather just go in the, 
go in their their uh, office or their bedroom and just like heads down work on what they think is they're supposed to be doing, whether it be pumping out blog posts or, or writing code, rather than like trying to hustle up a dozen people to use something that relates to whatever it is you're doing. And I see that all the time and I've been guilty of it too, but it's just, it's just, you know, that's, you gotta, that's level one. Yeah. I think in, in tech space, it's a lot harder to say, Hey, I have something to actually sell versus, you know, lawn care. You can go out and knock doors and, and scrounge up a lot of business pretty quick if you hustle. Whereas if you're building an app, it's hard to say enough's enough. Now I have a product, let's put it to market and develop the rest from there on. Because yeah. there, there's a reason you have an MVP. It's called the minimum viable product. Because you, if you try and put every feature set that you're trying to put into an app, into the initial product, you're never gonna get anything off the ground and get it out the door. It's, it's, you don't even know what those features need to be. Yeah, that's exactly. The, that's the sad thing. Well, and that's the thing, no amount of thought or mapping or whatever is going to address every customer need. And, right. and ultimately you just have to start in order to uh, to get to that. That's right, everything that's big starts small. And if you can really codify it down to a series of steps and levels and not even worry about the other stuff, just get, get a dozen customers, then worry about all the other stuff. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Well, hey, Brian, as we're coming to the end here, do you want to uh, sort of give a shout out or t- tell people where they can find you, uh, the product and, and learn more about you or connect? Yeah, so, uh, you know, anyway, listen to this in the United States that doesn't want to waste time mowing their yard. Life's too short to cut your own grass. So just download Green Pal in the App Store or Play Store. You'll get hooked up with a great lawn mowing service in less than a couple minutes. Anybody that uh, is listening to this is like, oh, man, I, I want to ask that guy a question. Uh, just hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be happy to, to help you out. If, if my experience, it, it can help you with something very specific that you're dealing with. Um, you know, don't, don't email me and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about starting a business, but I don't have any ideas. What do you think? Like, like ask me a specific question about a specific product, about a specific thing that you're working on. And, I, and if I can help you, I will. But just hit me up on LinkedIn and I'd be glad to respond. That's well, great. thanks, Brian. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, this has been a, an awesome conversation. I think there's lots of good stuff in there. Uh, quick little uh, housekeeping matter. Just want to encourage people to interact with the show. If you enjoyed our conversation here with Brian and you want to reach out, ask any questions via the show, uh, make future guest recommendations or anything like that, please do. It's uh, You can visit our website. It's eggscast.com. Click on contact and you can fill out the form and get in touch right away. We're uh, really looking to build community this year in 2021. And uh, we need your help to do that. So please feel free to reach out to us or Brian directly uh, via any of the links he he mentioned. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, Brian. This has been really great. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tuned in this week and every week. And we'll see you all next time.